everyone, my name is Clancy's and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. So let's get into today's case and it is the case of Martin van der Merwe and Sinead van Hilden, the graveyard killer couple. So before I go any further, I just want to warn you that this case is unusual, it is gruesome, and it also involves themes of animal cruelty, self-harming, body mutilation, as well as severe mental health issues. So if any of those themes might trigger you in any way, please click off this video. I will definitely see you in my next video. Thank you. And also before I go any further, if I may please ask, give this video a like because it helps me to create more videos like this one. So let's start with Chanel van Hirden, her upbringing as well as her life. So Chanel van Hirden was born in the Free State province of South Africa in a small little town called Welcome. She was one of three kids to the van Hirden parents. So Sinead's parents' marriage was in shatters to a point where Sinead's mother was ready to call it quits when she discovered that she was pregnant with Sinead. Sinead's mother resented the fact that she fell pregnant just before she was about to call it quits. And as a result, when Sinead was born, she resented her, resulting with the mother not bonding with her child as well as feeding her, let alone carry her whenever she cried or was in distress. As Sinead grew up, she realized that her mother did not particularly like her. And as a result of that, their relationship was strained. So when Sinead was about six or seven years old, her parents finally filed for divorce and they went their separate ways. Not long after Sinead van Hirden's mother divorced her father, she met and married a very abusive man. So it also turned out that this man was not only violent to Sinead's mother, but he was also violent and very abusive to her children too. Sinead did not like her stepfather at all, so much so that she decided to go live with her father. When she went to live with her father, she discovered that the father was already married to another woman, meaning that Sinead now had a stepfather as well as a stepmother. She hated the stepmother. She did not want to accept her in her life. She tried everything in her best to make sure that her father divorced this woman because she just did not get along with her. However, the stepmother was a kind woman. She made sure that Shanae always felt at home, welcomed, as well as taken care of. Unfortunately, Shanae did not see that this woman was actually very kind to her. So to shut the world away, Sinead then developed an interest in fine art. She would bury herself and her sorrows as well as the worries she had as a young kid into drawing. As far as she was concerned, drawing was her happy place and that brought some sort of solace in her life. So when Sinead van Hirden grew stronger in her fine art interest, she also developed an interest in the dark world or the occult world. She was curious about the supernatural. She was curious about Satan. She was curious basically about cults and all that stuff that was not supposed to be looked at by a child as young as seven years old. So when Sinead turned about eight or nine years old, she then went to her father and told him that she could speak to the dead or people that no one else can see. Of course, her father was not having it. He then decided to take her to his father who was a pastor, who said to him, your daughter has a demon and I'm going to take her to church and I will exorcise the demon out of her. So indeed, her grandfather in the presence of the church then began to exorcise the demon that had possessed Shanae. Unfortunately for Shanae, she said that was the most traumatic moment in her life. She felt humiliated, she felt uncared for, and she felt like she was weird and an outsider. And as a result of that, she dug deeper into the supernatural world. And that is where she said she would find solace outside of fine art.
Unfortunately, the exorcism did not work. It was nothing but a humiliating practice by her grandfather. So after the failed exorcism, Shanae's father took her to a psychologist to have her evaluated. The psychologist could not find anything particularly wrong with Shanae. So the psychologist felt that Shanae might possibly have some sort of mental health issue but they were not sure what it is. They just thought maybe it was depression. And as a result, they gave her some mood medications. Unfortunately, those medications would make her feel even worse about herself. When Shanae turned about 10 years old, she attempted to stab her stepmother. I'm assuming that the stepmother tried to show Shanae some affection as well as love, but all of that was rejected by Shanae. She probably felt that the stepmother was trying to make a mockery of her, and that just irritated her. As a result, she attempted to stab her. Shanae's father never gave up in trying to find the solution to his daughter's mental health. He wanted to know what was wrong with her. Every psychologist that he had taken her to, they would give her medicine, and the medicine was just not working. When Shanae felt that she was being forced in taking medication, she then resorted to start cutting herself just to cope from all the pressure that was coming from her father as well as her stepmother, including her own mother that lived with another husband elsewhere. So once again, Shanae's father and also the stepmother did not stop trying to figure out how exactly are they going to make Shanae happy? So that is when they came up with an idea that perhaps Shanae just wants to spend more time with her father. And as a result, her father then decided to take Shanae to hunting. The hunting exercise was going to be a bonding exercise. It seemed to work really, really well as a matter of fact. Because whenever Shanae was with her father in the forest hunting, she seemed to be happy. She seemed to have a smile on her face. It looks like she had no worry or anything that was bothering her. She seemed to have cast it aside and just focused on the task at hand, hunting for animals, which she and her father would catch. Every time they caught an animal, the father would give Shanae the responsibility to skin the animal. Shanae enjoyed this job of skinning animals. She enjoyed the sound of the knife going through the skin, separating the flesh from the skin. She says that it was satisfying feeling and sound to her ears. So one day when she was busy skinning animals, a thought crossed her mind that wondered, how would it feel like skinning a human being? So she kept the thoughts to herself. She did not want to tell anyone about it, especially her father, who might take her to another pastor and may humiliate her by exercising her for a demon that does not exist as far as she was concerned. So as Shanae grew into a teenager, she showed and exhibited signs that she was hanging out with the wrong crowd because some of the crowd that she was seen with were boys and girls that were known to be doing drugs in the area. At one point, Shanae did take drugs and when she was out, a male friend of hers took advantage of her and sexually assaulted her. As a result of that, Shanae never told anybody about that incident. Instead, Shanae took all of her hurt and feelings onto her drawing board. She just expressed her feelings in drawing her pain. So one day, Shanae heard news that her mother had divorced her old husband and now was married to a new man who decided to pack up and leave with her to New Zealand. That broke Shanae. She felt that she was being neglected by her own mother, who has always never been in her life, resenting her for reasons she never understood. Now her mother was no longer in sight. She felt even deeper into sadness, realizing that her mother really didn't care about her. She could not understand why her mother would abandon her at the time she needed her most. Both Shanae's father and stepmother stepped in, made sure that Shanae felt loved, 
felt welcomed, felt accepted, and felt that she could speak to them about absolutely anything that was going through her. The interesting thing that happened to Shanae was when she came to realization that her stepmother really cared about her, their relationship became better and they became closer. However, she never stopped her interest in the occult. She never stopped thinking about the supernatural and wondering and basically delving into the supernatural world because she found it fascinating. And this is when she met a man who told her that he was a Satanist and that occult was something that he and his group practiced. Shanae was fascinated by this man. She ended up dating him because she wanted to be part and parcel of this satanic world that he talked about. After Shanae had attended several of the worship or whatever it is that they practice in the Satanist church, she was not interested. She felt that this is not what she was looking for. Something more and deeper than what she had seen that these people were doing. So she lost interest in this guy completely. Even though Shade had lost interest in Satanism, she still continued to date this man. When Shade turned 16, she decided to drop out of high school and go to a fine art college nearby because she just wanted to be a fine artist. She was not interested in the school subjects that she was doing. All she wanted was to draw because that is where she found solace. Fortunately for her, both her father and stepmother supported her decision and enrolled her at a nearby school that did fine art only. When Shine attended the fine art school, she couldn't be more happier. She was smiling, people liked her because she was a likable girl, and also she worked really, really hard to ensure that she finished school and graduate and go find a job that she loved. So as Shanae's life was beginning to come together because she was excited about her new life in this school, the first thing that she did was to break up with a satanic boyfriend. Secondly, she then decided to move out of her parents' home and go live with her sister so she can focus fully on her schoolwork and her art. When Shanae turned 19, she graduated from her art school. And not long after she had graduated from art school, she found a job as a graphic designer in this great company. And the money was also good. Shanae's father and stepmother were so excited and proud of her. For the first time, Shanae felt accomplished. She felt that finally she is making the people she cared about proud of her. So when she turned 20, she met a man by the name of Warren. Warren and Shanae hit it off and they were head over heels in love with each other. Shanae, for the first time, once again, she felt accepted. She felt that she belonged somewhere. The feeling of euphoria when she realized that she was worth it all along. This is exactly what her stepmother has been telling her since she walked in her life. Few of the things that Warren loved about Shanae, she was incredible, she was outgoing, she was smart and beautiful. And that made Shanae smile from ear to ear because she never used to hear words like that describing her. She always felt worthless throughout her life simply because of the abandonment she felt from her mother. Warren was smitten by Shanae. He could see no wrong from her. He even did not believe the type of person that Shanae turned out to be in the end. He was like, there is no way that is Shanae van Hirden that I knew and loved. However, Shanae was not always the favorite of Warren's friend. One particular friend by the name of Roy did not like Shanae. He just did not trust her at all. Something about Shanae that he did not like. And he didn't know how exactly to tell his friend Warren or warn him about this girl. But so, there was nothing he could have done about it. All he saw was his friend happy with a girl that he did not like. So one night, Roy threw a house party and invited all of his friends, including Warren, 
who came with Shanae to the party. At the party, Shanae noticed a man. All that she felt for this man was an incredible connection, and she could not put her finger on it. What was it? However, she did not gather up the strength to go up to him and talk to him. So she just let it go and hoped that in the future, their path would cross again. Maybe she would be brave enough to speak to him. So one day, out of the blue, Sinead decided to break it off with Warren with absolutely no warning. Warren was baffled, wondering, what did I do? Why did she just break up with me? Because I have not treated her or done anything that warranted her to break up with me. So I kind of like suspect that Roy might have had something to do with it. Maybe found some dirt on Shanae and went and threatened her with it that if she did not break it off with him, he was definitely going to expose her not only to Warren but also to her job. So maybe Shanae felt that she had a lot to lose and that is why she just abruptly broke up her relationship that seemed to be successful and made her happy. The breakup absolutely made no sense. If it's not that, I think maybe it's because of the man that she saw at the party that she had some sort of emotional connection with, but never said a word to him. Oh, by the way, the man that Shanae saw at the party, his name was Martin van der Merver. So who is this Martin van der Merver? He too was born and raised in Valcom. He too, I could not find his date of birth. I hate to say this, but Martin van der Merwe gives me cancer vibes. Martin van der Merwe's upbringing was also not a great one. He too felt like the black sheep of the family, the community, school, and everywhere else he landed. People did not seem to connect with him, and he did not understand why people never liked him. Yet he was such a nice guy, he was caring, he was compassionate, passionate, and it could help anybody in distress. So he did not understand what is it that was wrong with him. At school, Martin van der Merwe experienced severe bullying. Kids just did not like him at all. Martin van der Merwe had to endure pain, suffering, rejection. All he ever wanted was to be accepted and also enjoy school like all the other kids. He also wanted to enjoy his neighborhood and have friends that he could hang out with at the mall or at the house party or get invited to birthday parties like his classmates would get invited and talk about it at school. But he was always the lonely boy, the outsider, the black sheep. Martin's parents divorced when he was very young and whenever he was asked about his parents' divorce, he would say he's indifferent about it. He doesn't remember having both his parents under one roof with love, so he didn't care. But Martin was quite close to both his parents, even though they lived separate lives. Unfortunately, as Martin van der Merwe grew older, he developed some severe mental health illnesses. It's also possible that his mental illness may be a contributing factor as to why people treated him differently. At the age of six or seven years old, Martin started to see things that no one else saw. He was always delusional about a dragon that would come to him and promise him that it will make him the king of the world. However, the same dragon will tell him that one day I will return and dethrone you. Martin's hallucinations grew stronger when he turned 15, to a point where his father then started to take him to different psychiatrists to have him evaluated. All the psychologists and psychiatrists that evaluated him all agreed that he was suffering or he had schizophrenia. This devastated Martin's parents, especially his mother, who became distant from him because of the diagnosis. I'm not sure if she did not trust him or she just did not want to deal with the fact that her son is diagnosed with schizophrenia. So this resulted with Martin being medicated all the time in order to control his schizophrenia. It seemed to work because he would have very limited episodes of schizophrenia that showed signs that the medication was working. 
Even Martin himself felt that the medication was working. He could find peace in his head. Unfortunately, the bullying at school was unbearable for Martin to a point where he decided to drop out of school. So when he dropped out of school, he moved in with his father. And then he was just staying at home, twiddling his thumb and turning with the sun at home. So now and again, there will be cats that will come into his yard and then it will be attacked by the dogs to death. And then his job was to make sure that he got rid of the dead cats by burying them. So every time he buried a dead cat, that is when he started developing an interest in death. To a point where he would collect all the cats that were killed by the dogs and then he would observe the different state of decomposition. This fascinated Martin so much so that he would now go outside of his house looking for cats to kill. Martin van der Merwe said every time he went out looking for cats, he would not know that he is actually looking for cats and when he found one, he found himself with a cat dead in his hand with its neck wrung. He further said that death seemed to be more and more fascinating to him and that whenever he saw a dead animal, he felt satisfaction. So one day his father was just fed up having him sitting at home doing nothing. So he then, you're going to have to pull your weight and earn some money. And that is when his father hired him in his carpentry company. But Martin did not last long in the carpentry company of his dad when he decided to open his own furniture shop. But before he opened his furniture business, he went to his father to ask for capital to start the business. When his father realized that Martin had a good plan, he then borrowed him the capital to start his furniture business. When Martin started his furniture business, the business thrived. It was successful. For the first time, Martin felt that he was accomplishing something, considering the fact that all of his life, he always felt like a failure. Martin's life seemed to be going very well. Even himself felt very good about himself, accomplished, successful, and his business was employing more people and he was becoming a good name in society. And so he stopped taking his medicine. He felt confident because he had not had any psychotic episodes in a very long time. So to him, he felt he no longer needed the medication for his schizophrenia. So Martin van der Merwe, when he realized that he was becoming more and more successful in his life, he then decided to move out of his father's house and move in with his friend Roy. Roy was excited having Martin over. He always described Martin as being a very passionate, loving, caring, a guy that is considerate of other people and he was friendly people just gravitated towards him out of the blue. To me, that description is of a cancer. So to officially welcome Martin to the house, Roy then decided to throw a second house party. Once again, he invited all of his friends, including Shanae van Hirden. Once again, Shanae van Hirden sees the same man that she saw in the previous party, Martin van der Merwe. Previously, she had promised herself that if she ever met this guy again, she was going to brave it up and approach him and start a conversation. But she still felt the same way she felt the first time about him, some kind of connection. So this time around, she garnered all of her strength and started a conversation with Martin. Both of them hit her off. It was as if they've known each other for a very long time. Even after the party was over, they remained behind just chatting, laughing, hugging, and basically showing some affection towards each other. So the more Martin and Shanae talked, the more they realized that they had a lot in common. And the more they realized they had a lot in common, the more the chemistry between them was almost at an explosive levels. At this point in time, they were now head over heels in love with each other, which was quite strange that you meet a person the first time and you're already in love, 
both of you are already in love with each other? Well, they do say that there is love at first sight. Probably this is the case. Sinead did say that meeting Martin made her so happy. She felt fulfilled. She had a great job and she was now independent and dependent on herself. And now she found a boyfriend that she loved and loved her back. Sinead did share with her family that she finally found a love and that the man that she found makes her happy. She looked exactly when she did when they went hunting just happy and brazen about her happiness. So as the relationship grew, they both realized that they were fascinated about the occults. Occult. They also discovered that their upbringings were almost similar, including how they viewed society and how society viewed them. They concluded that they were meant to be, that they were a match made in heaven. So one of the places that Shanae and Martin enjoyed the most, which they called the happy place, was the cemetery, the graveyard. That is where they would have their dates. That is where they would make love. That is where they found happiness amongst the dead. Shanae would even say they felt more alive at the cemetery. And that is ironic to say the least. She said, the thought of being surrounded by the dead is fascinating. Roy testified in court that one day, both Shanae and Martin took him to the cemetery where they performed what looked like a satanic ritual. They both cut themselves and poured their blood into a bowl and then they dipped two rings which they exchanged and made some vows as though they were getting married. He found himself just flabbergasted at everything that was taking place, yet they did not explain to him what they were doing. He felt as though they were making him a witness to their wedding. So after the satanic ritual, both Martin and Shanae started sharing their deep darkest secrets and their deep darkest wishes. Shanae wished to know how it felt like to skin a human being. While Martin's wish was to know how it felt like to kill a human being. In February of 2011, both Martin and Shanae agreed that they needed to take their desires a little bit further and find their first victim so that they can get satisfied by these desires that they are having. So in order for them to find their first victim, they needed to plan. And the only way they can plan is if they move in together, the resulting with them finding an apartment where they moved in together. And Shanae bought a journal where she journaled all of her thoughts and feelings about how she was going to skin a human being. She even had poems about how it's going to be like to skin a human being. One of the lines in her poem said, skinning people, revealing the truth. So in order for them to practice their evil thoughts, they then decided to go to a nearby pet store where they bought two cats. Guys, this part is very graphic, very painful. I even shed a tear when I read that. So the purpose of the two cats was for Martin and Shanae to practice on torturing and killing them slowly. So the moment they arrived in the apartment, Shanae took one of the cats and nailed it crucifixion style. And once the cat looked like it was on a cross, that is when she started taking a knife and decapitating the cat while it was still alive. But Martin felt that his own cat, he is not going to kill it that quickly. He wanted it to suffer a slow death. So when Shanae was done with her cat, that is when Martin took his own and then he began to stab it. Martin would frequently stab the cat and he made sure the stabbing was as vigorous as vigorous can be. And the poor cat would just scream in pain. So after they were done killing the cats, they then decided to go and buy a dog. 
and continued doing what they did to the cat, to the dog. But Shanae changed her mind and said, not a dog. There is no way I can kill a dog or allow you to kill a dog. Martin, being the obedient boyfriend to Shanae, agreed with her and said, not a dog. So a dog was spared. So after killing the two cats, that is when they started looking at each other and saying, definitely we are ready for a human being. So Martin and Shanae then started looking for the best way to find a human victim. And the best way to find a victim, a human victim, was to go online. Go to a social media page called To Go. I've never heard of that social media page before, but apparently it existed. And that is where some people met each other. Apparently some people are still married to this day, having met on To Go. If you've ever heard of this website before, please comment down below and let me know when was that, where was I? So when Shanae went to, on to go, she met a man by the name of Michael Van Eck. He was a 23-year-old technician who worked at a Velcom mine, shaft number four. Michael Van Eck, six months ago, he had ended a long-term relationship with a girlfriend he loved very much. So he was now ready for love again. Hence, he went on to go to find somebody that he could form a loving relationship with. And that's when he met Shanae Van Hirden. Shanae and Michael started talking, basically trying to develop some kind of trust between them. Considering the fact that they met on cyberspace, there is no way that anybody can trust anyone meeting up like that. So Michael felt that they needed to chat just a little bit longer just to make sure that he can trust the person he was chatting up with online. So during one of the online chats, that is when Shanae proposed that they meet for the first time. And she even gave him a place to meet. Yes, you guessed it right. The cemetery. At first, Michael thought, that is weird that you want us to meet at the cemetery at 9 p.m.? Come on, there's got to be a better place where we can meet for the first time, other than the cemetery. But Shanae pushed and said that was her happy place. Cha, I would have ran. So the meetup was scheduled for the 2nd of April, 2011, at the Velcom Cemetery. So for safety precautions, Michael then told his boss that he was going on a date with a girl he met online, but they are going to meet at the Velcom Cemetery. When his boss heard that they were going to meet at the Velcom Cemetery at 9 p.m., he was not happy with that arrangement. He thought that was number one strange, number two too dangerous, and then he tried to talk Michael out of going to meet up with this girl at the cemetery that late at night. However, Michael was determined to go on this date. He just told his boss, don't worry, everything is fine. Mind you, Michael has a black belt in karate and he's also quite fit because he goes to the gym regularly. So he thought he was strong enough to fight off anybody that might try him. So after speaking to his boss, he went to his mother, whom he told a different story. All he said to his mother was, he is going on a date with a girl that he was going to take to the movies. And then after that, he was going to return back home. So of course his mother did not worry at all because it's a normal thing. When young people go out on dates, they meet up somewhere, they go to the movies, they go to the restaurant, never to the cemetery. However, I think I understand why he told his mother a different story because I know as tomorrow exists that your mother is going to talk you out of meeting anybody at the cemetery at 9 p.m. No way. So he thought he doesn't want to get talked out by his mother, whom he respected, so he told her a different story. So after Michael had agreed to meet Shanae at her favorite place, the graveyard, that is when Shanae sat down with Martin and they started drafting a list for their murder kit. And this is what the murder kit contained. Surgical blade, needles, knife, wet wipes, 
candles, a black, no, black plastic bags, ropes, and blankets. For the date, she took a costume, box, a hammer, and wire. So Martin and Sinead devised a plan when Michael arrives at the cemetery. So basically, when Michael arrives at the cemetery, they would first have dug a hole. Number two, they would have laid a beautiful picnic basket as well as a blanket and lit up a candle to make it look convincing for Michael to trust that indeed that was a date between him and Shanae. But before that, Shanae was to go and meet Michael at the cemetery entrance and then they will walk up to the picnic area. At 8.40 p.m., Shanae went to the entrance of the graveyard and at 8.55, Michael pulled up and he was relieved and happy to see Shanae. Number one, he felt, okay, this is a real person, a real woman, and definitely she's as beautiful as a picture on to go. So he was confident that indeed he was going to have a wonderful date in this strange place. So he got out of the car. They greeted each other, gave each other a hug, and then they began to walk up towards the cemetery. That is when Michael saw that there was a picnic basket on a picnic blanket with a candle light, and then he felt even more comfortable. And Michael seemed to be enjoying the conversation. I'm assuming that the first question that Michael asked Shanae was, why here? because I know that would have been my first question too, because I would want to know what is the fascination with cemetery and dates, but I doubt I would even go on a date to a cemetery with anybody. I don't care how nice you are. Michael seemed to be attracted to Shanae and Shanae saw that. And that is when Shanae started to lean forward for a kiss out of the blue, Martin jumped out and began to stab Michael in the back. He stabbed Michael 29 times, but Martin, being a karate expert as well as a fit person, he put up a fight. He was not going down without a fight. He fought the man that was trying to attack him. In his mind, he thought he and Shanae were getting attacked until Martin called out to Shanae. This man is difficult to kill. Help me take the butcher knife and drive it through his back. And that is when Shanae took the butcher knife and began to stab him three times. And as Michael was going down, he said his last words, just kill me. I am assuming the reason why he said just kill me is either he realized that he was quite stupid to come and meet someone at the cemetery that late at night, or it was the pain he was feeling from the stab wounds or both. But I'm assuming it is the stab wounds that he just wanted to end, hence he begged them to just kill him. So when Michael was on the ground, that is when Martin came behind him and slit his throat and he finally died. So when Michael had finally died, that is when the two monsters proceeded to drag Michael's body to a blanket that they had brought with them. On the blanket, that is when they started decapitating or dismembering Michael's body. They cut out his right arm, his right hand, and amputated both his legs from the knee. The body parts that they needed, they stashed them in the black plastic bags that they had brought with them. So after they had collected all the body parts that they needed, the remainder of Michael, they buried him in a shallow grave that they had dug out with spoons. So once they were done burying Michael's remains, that is when they tried to clean up the murder scene. And then they left. When they left, they left with Michael's vehicle, which they dumped at the welcome taxi rank in the hope that someone would steal the car. And then if the police investigate and found the car, Michael's disappearance and death will be pinned on the person that stole his car. 
So on the 3rd of April 2011, the graveyard workers arrived in the morning for duty. That is when they saw a pool of blood at the entrance of the graveyard. So they decided to do a little bit more of investigation by going a little bit further into the graveyard. And that is when they came across a pool of blood and other pools of blood where Michael was murdered. And that is when they called their superior to come and see and confirm if this indeed blood of a human being. When the superior arrived, he indeed confirmed that this is the blood of a human being and he wasted no time and called the police. While the police were being called, they also were called to the welcome taxi rank where they reported an abandoned vehicle with, key, with its keys still in the ignition. So the police were divided into two. Others went to the graveside to check what was going on. The police at the welcome taxi rank ran the registration plate number and they made a hit. The vehicle belonged to Michael van Eyck. So the next day, on the 3rd of April 2011, Michael's mother became worried because Michael had not returned home after his date. So she consoled herself by thinking that perhaps Michael did go to work early that morning without letting her know that he had an early morning. So she then just waited a little bit while, but she ended up calling the mine just to find out if Michael did have an early morning. But his boss was like, no, Michael had not arrived to work yet. That is when Michael's boss told Michael's mother that the last time he saw Michael, he was going on a date with this woman at the Welcome Cemetery. Michael's mother was like, no, Michael had gone on a date with a woman and they were going to go to a movie. But the boss was like, no, that is not what Michael told me. And that is when Michael's mother began to worry. She ran straight to the police where she opened a case of a missing person. So the police then decided that they were going to bring the cadaver dogs to the Welcome Cemetery in searching for Michael. When they got to the cemetery, Michael's mother wasted no time in searching for her son and she came across what looked like his t-shirt. The t-shirt was covered in blood and so she knew exactly that the t-shirt belonged to Michael. So she became even more worried thinking that her son was injured somewhere in the cemetery. That is when the cadaver dogs were released to look for Michael. And one of the dogs sat in what looked like a pile of freshly, of freshly covered soil. And they knew what they were going to find under there. So forensic came and started excavating some of the soil that was on top of the content. And as they began to dig, and that is when they came across a badly decapitated body without a head. Michael's mother was inconsolable. She just knew that was her son because of the t-shirt that she could recognize that belonged to Michael. It was however left to Michael's father to go and identify the body if whether it was of Michael. Michael had a birthmark and that birthmark, it was a giveaway to his father that the body was indeed Michael Van Eck. Michael's mother was inconsolable. So the police now had a murder investigation on their hands, but they also knew that this investigation was going to be a very difficult one considering the fact that Michael's body was decapitated and some of his body parts taken away. So they thought this was an occult murder or Muti murder. So they had to call a specialist by the name of Henriette Nell. Now, Detective Henriette Nell is a trained detective in the occult. And so she knew exactly where to look for her victim as well as the people that may be responsible for Michael's killing. So the first thing she told the police was to go into Michael's phone and find the last person that Michael had contacted. So for the next two days, the police attempted to access Michael's phone. 
On the 4th of April 2011, Martin van der Merwer went to Shanae's father to ask for her hand in marriage. However, Shanae's father, inasmuch as he was happy with Martin's proposal, he still felt that they were still too young to get married. However, he did give Martin his blessings, but advised them to wait a while until they are fully ready. After all, Shanae was still 20 years old and Martin was only 25 years old. So on the 5th of April 2011, the police finally got access to Martin van Eck's phone and the first name that they saw that was the last number they had called belonged to Shanae van Heerden. And so Henriette Nell then started to think of a strategy on how she was going to lure Chanel so she can question him about Michael. So for almost the entire day of the 5th of April 2011, they tried to call Shanae who would not answer her phone. Eventually, a little bit late in the afternoon, she answered her phone. And that is when Nell told Shanae that there was a girl who had listed her as, an em as her emergency number that was involved in a car accident. Now the hospital needs to operate on her. However, they cannot operate on her without her emergency contact positively identifying her and giving permission for the operation to go ahead. So Shanae feeling all important and also curious who this girl was. She then asked her boyfriend or fiance, whatever he is, to please accompany her to the hospital to see this girl that the hospital had called her about. As they drove to the hospital and when they arrived at the hospital, that is when they found themselves surrounded by police with guns drawn. And that is when they knew that the gig was up. Nell then approached both Shanae and Martin to explain to them why they were there. Shanae and Martin did not put up a fight, did not resist anything. All that Shanae did was, all right, you got us. I will tell you everything that you need to know. So they were quickly separated from each other. Shanae then asked Nell if she could please speak to Martin in private. But Nell said that is not going to happen. So Martin was taken in a different police van while Shanae also was taken by another van to the police station. But Shanae was like, wait, don't take me to the police station yet. First, take me to my apartment so I can show you the rest of Michael. The police looked at each other and thought, hmm, this is the most easiest investigation they have ever embarked upon. So indeed, they were led by Shanae to her apartment. The moment Shanae opened the door of her apartment, she went straight to the fridge and took out a container which had Michael's facial skin in it. That is when Shanae looked at Detective Nell and said, I've always wanted to skin a human being. So it turns out after killing Michael and they arrived home, Shanae sat down and began to skin Michael's head in the most precise and concise way that when Michael's skin was skinned off his head, it looked like a mask. So that is when Shanae started showing the police more containers. One of the containers had Michael's eyes and the other container had Michael's ears. As Shanae was busy showing the police all of Michael's parts, she had a smirk on her face. She looked cold-blooded. She didn't care. She had no remorse, no emotion. All she had was a smirk on her face. She looked like she was getting satisfaction from what she had done. At the police station, Martin admitted to the police that after killing Michael, they stole his 1,000 Rand and he said they were going to use the money to buy shovels because when they used spoons to dig up the hole and bury Michael's body, it was tedious as well as tiring and ridiculous. So they felt that if they bought shovels, it would be easier to dig a grave and also bury their next victim, he told the police. So at the apartment, the police discovered Shanae's diary or journal 
which she had very dark thoughts that she had jotted down on her journal. The police were shocked at what they were reading. They were reading a journal of a really disturbed human being. The journal read like a horror movie script. She described everything that she had done to Michael, which confirmed to the police that they had the right people for the murder of Michael Fanek. So psychologists, psychiatrists, criminologists, the judge, including the police, deemed Shanae as the most dangerous criminal that they have ever came across. A psychiatrist even went around the world asking other psychiatrists and psychologists if they have ever come across a case like this one. They all agreed that this is the most rarest case the world has ever seen because it has never happened anywhere else where the murderer beheads his victim and comes home and then skins the head perfectly. They have never seen anything like it. And all psychologists, criminologists, and psychiatrists agreed that Shanae should never be let out because if she was, she would become the most gruesome, cruelest, and horrific serial killer South Africa and the world would have ever seen. So at the police station, Martin was being questioned by the police about where the other parts of Michael's were. And that is when Martin said, I can take you to his head as well as other body parts. So the police were like, okay, lead us then to where you buried them. And that is when Martin took them to the apartment, the backyard, where they buried the two cats they had killed earlier in the month. So when Martin began to dig up Michael's other body parts, he had a smirk on his face. He too seemed like he was enjoying what he was doing, showing the police Michael's other remains. So when Shanae's father heard of her arrest, he came running to their apartment, huffing and puffing and demanding that the police release his daughter who is innocent. The police tried to explain to him that your daughter actually confessed that she is responsible for the murder of Michael Van Eck. So Shanae's father asked the police if he could speak with his daughter in private. And that is when Chanel looked at her father dead in his eyes and said, It's something I've been wanting to do since I was three years old. I wanted to do it. I did it. And I would do it again. Now, that is what she told her father. He was flabbergasted. He felt defeated. He walked away slowly. So at the police station, Shanae as well as Martin, all they did was looking carefree as if they had not murdered anybody. They did not care, especially Shanae. She had no emotions. She showed no humanity. Instead, she showed satisfaction. She showed accomplishment and she was happy basically. However, on Martin's side, he started to show some humanity and guilt for what he had done. He admitted that he knew what they were doing was wrong and he could have stopped it. He admitted that he was not under any type of influence, let alone his mental illness. So eventually at the police station, both Martin and Shanae were formally charged with murder, robbery, mutilation of a corpse and defeating the ends of justice. So at trial, Shanae had her own trial. While Martin had his own trial, the reason why they separated the trials was because Martin had to go under psychiatric evaluation considering the fact that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So they wanted to make sure that he was fit and proper to stand trial. And indeed, the verdict came that Martin was fit to stand trial. So he could not plead not guilty by reason of insanity. So experts were called on the stand in court to testify about both Shanae and Martin in their respective trials and they all agreed that Shanae is the most dangerous criminal that South Africa has ever seen and if she is released, she will kill again. And on the other side, Martin showed sign of humanity. 
he also showed potential of rehabilitation. Though they could not tell that he would be rehabilitated fully upon the day of his release if he would not commit the same crime again. During his psychological evaluation, Martin admitted to one of the psychiatrists that when they killed Michael, he did not feel any satisfaction from the kill. He even admitted that after Michael, they had planned for their next victim. So during Martin's mitigation of sentence, he finally broke. He showed emotions. He cried. He even wrote a letter of apology to the Fund X. But unfortunately, the Fund X did not want any of his apology. Michael's mother, who was seated in front in the court gallery, she shook her head as if to say, I will never forgive you. I will never forgive you. Both Shanae van Heerden and Martin van der Merwe pleaded guilty to the murder of Michael van Eck. Shanae van Heerden refused to see or speak to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. All she said was, I don't feel guilty for what I have done. The court then said Shanae had no chance of getting rehabilitated. Therefore, Shanae was sentenced to 25 years in prison and an additional 15 years for robbery by stealing Michael's 1,000 rand and other items that were found in her apartment that belonged to Michael. So the court then ruled that if Shanae had come to the end of her sentences, she would have to convince the court as to why she should be released into society. The judge further said, there is no court right in his mind that would be convinced to release her into society. She will spend the rest of her life in prison simply because she is dangerous and if she was released, she would become a serial killer. However, Martin's sentence was a little bit lenient. He got life imprisonment, an additional 10 years for robbery, and another 5 years for mutilation of a corpse. The reason why he was deemed to have potential of being rehabilitated was the fact that he showed emotion, guilt, he even wrote an apology letter to the Fun X family. Anyways, if you like this video, give it a like, subscribe to my YouTube channel and don't forget to click the bell notification so that you get notified every time I upload a new true crime story. Please leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think of this case. Share this video far and wide. I would highly appreciate that. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time with a new true crime video. Goodbye.